All right. Hello and welcome to pitch session, the first uh, or first of two parallel sessions, one focusing on use cases and services. Uh, I hope you've had a chance to watch uh, and participate in some of the sessions before uh, on the plenary, as well as the practical and thought leadership cases uh, or, or presentations. Uh, we are here now having eight different, very brief uh, pitches, very practical ones. Uh, so this one is speci specifically on the, on the more use case oriented ones. Uh, so we will have uh, five minutes for each of these uh, sessions and just time for a quick Q and A. Uh, I encourage you to make use of the chat and the Q and A that you see on the top right of your screen. Uh, I will pick up one or two questions uh, um, at the end while we're um, shifting between uh, between the uh, previous and uh, next presenter. Um, but uh, but uh, perhaps not all the questions can be answered, but I encourage the speakers, of course, to after their own presentation to participate uh, in, in the chats as well. And after this session, we have two hours of uh, networking time, so make use of that time as well. But the pitches are the key thing. Let's get to that. So I will first invite on stage uh, from my life capsule, um, Pam Morehouse. Uh, and uh, yeah, we've actually, the topic of uh, life events has been one that's uh, uh, actually interested us in the My Data community for some time. And uh, unfortunately, we've not yet had Pam at our event, so we're happy to have you have you now so uh, welcome and uh, go go with it thank you very much timu it's an absolute pleasure to be here bear with me while i'm sharing my screen just confirming you've got my screen now great Hello everyone, I'm Pam Morehouse, the CEO and co-founder of My Life Capsule, a secure data and file sharing software designed to help individuals and families to manage day-to-day -day and time-critical life administration. So between work, personal, home and family commitments, most of us are overwhelmed and sometimes things get out of control. Forgotten passwords, lost ID cards, hacked email accounts and important identity, finance, legal, education, travel and medical documents get lost. The average adult spends 109 hours on personal admin annually, while parents do 1,040 hours and if you're a carer, you can multiply it all again. And when we experience a significant life event, such as a divorce or illness, our administrative tasks and our stress levels increase. During my divorce, I sat with piles of paperwork and I felt complete overwhelm. I had an incapacity to act because there was so much to be done. Later, when our family lost a loved one, our entire family suffered because we didn't know where his will was, if he had a power of attorney or who his lawyers or accountants were. So last year, we launched My Life Capsule's direct-to-consumer apps to help individuals and families to organise, protect and share important information. Complete privacy and state-of-the-art security provide 24-7 access from anywhere in the world. And we're now helping individuals and families in more than 40 countries. With My Life Capsule, there is no more sharing sensitive information via insecure email accounts and no more scrolling through inboxes or wading through filing cabinets. Each My Life Capsule account provides categorised vaults with mobile access to critical life admin, from finance and legal to passwords and identity, while unique time-based data and file sharing fosters personal data control. Our in-app life event checklists help people prepare for and manage a range of significant life events. While the junior vaults help parents to organise children's admin from medication and allergy records to school reports and certificates, which is particularly important during separation and divorce when a child's data needs to be shared safely between two parties. Now let's pause there for a moment because it's 2022 and from here global consumers expect their service providers to protect their data, but it's not enough for client relationships to thrive. The enterprise problem is that personal, legal and financial service providers don't share data and files with clients securely 
don't use efficient methods for obtaining client information and don't help clients organise, protect and share their critical information. Let's take Jenny, who is a managing partner of a large legal firm. She became a lawyer to help people navigate stressful life events, but she knows her clients struggle to manage their administration. But what keeps Jenny awake at night is a potential data breach or privacy infringement of both inbound and outbound personal client data. The firm's admin costs were skyrocketing, skyrocketing too because their client file and data retrieval process was taking so long. So Jenny engaged our privacy-first client engagement solution for enterprises known as the Partner Portal. Jenny has reduced her company's admin, enhanced operational security and improved client engagement by providing client capsules for individuals and families to manage their admin, making their lives more organised, better prepared and better protected. The partner portal for Jenny's law firm enables secure data and file sharing and client messaging to transfer important files directly into their client's private capsule. Jenny's partner portal also enables third-party data sharing with real-time client consent and customizable checklists have sped up the client onboarding for the entire family and estate law division. Unlike other file storage solutions, My Life Capsule fosters pri personal privacy and our strategic partnership with award-winning privacy and security experts, Miko, ensures that we'll stay ahead of the technology and the compliance curve to provide a di digital solution both our consumers, both consumers, enterprises and clients can trust. At My Life Capsule, we're on a privacy-first, heart-led mission to make life admin easier and more secure for individuals, families, and their service providers. I'm Pam Morehouse. Thank you for your interest in My Life Capsule. Thanks a lot, Pam, and that was uh, exemplary timekeeping as well. So thank you for that. <laughs> I'm sure you've done that once or twice, uh, once or twice before. Um, as we're waiting, uh, waiting for the next one, uh, uh, just uh, two quick questions you might want to answer. Uh, so, I mean, first of all, there was a question on data portability, how it's done. And secondly, mm -hmm. how many citizens or how many families are actually using the platform and what's their interest or benefit in using, uh, using the platform? If you can touch those in uh, one minute, I'll be happy. Yeah, great question. So um, we've got 2,300 end users on the platform at the moment um, from across uh, 40 countries. The majority of our users are in the UK, uh, Australia and throughout Europe. Um, in terms of, of the data, we keep the data is um, maintained via the Azure platform uh, in Ireland um, and Miko, our um, privacy and digital security partners, manage that for us. I do have a, a technical co-founder who could probably give you a better answer than that. Uh, but as the CEO of the company, that's, that's my response, Timu. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Pam. And Miko, indeed, is also present actually later on in the program in the children's session and is one of the MyData members and active contributors in the uh, MyData operators, um, as is our next uh, presenter, Lal, from iGrant. Um, so I'm going to put you, Pam, um, off for now. Thank you very much. Uh, and then, Lal, um, please, um, it's, uh, it's time for you to take it over. Thank you. Thank you, Temu. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the presentation on decentralized human-centric health data space, powered by my data operators or data intermediaries as defined by the EU Data Governance Act. My name is Lal Chandran. I'm the co-founder and CTO of iGrand.io. iGrand.io is among the first my data operators now for the third year in running. My presentation today aims to share our latest product where we are establishing Sweden's first health data space. The project is financed by Vinova, Sweden's innovations agency, and is joined by MyData Sweden and RISE, the Research Institute of Sweden. For those of you who are not familiar with what iGrand.io is and what a data intermediary is, iGrand.io is a data intermediary or a MyData operator. It helps organizations access and share personal data with the agreement of the individual involved. In the case of iGrand.io, it provides consented data exchange and verification services, meaning it guarantees control access based on individual's consent to use their data. Example, 
organization A and B can exchange data as long as it's mutually agreed and signed by the individual and the organizations involved. iGrant.io facilitates a transaction without touching the data and the entire transaction is fully auditable. In simple terms, iGrant.io provides access to what we call as the right data. By right data, we mean data that has been obtained and processed in a lawful manner, data that can be shared in an auditable manner, and data that can be verified at any given point of time. The platform takes a protocol-centric approach to provide data exchange and verification services instead of the traditional APIs to connect, consume, and share sensitive personal data. Here in the slide, the data using service can gain lawful access to verifiable data at, at scale. Every data transaction is cryptographically signed by the parties involved with the possibility to audit independently. In this case, between the individual and the data source or a data using service at any given point of time. And once transacted, iGrant.io guarantees the data integrity and data source authenticity. In this project we are embarking on, we are establishing the Nordics data space. With the Nordics da data, we are creating a working model of a decentralized data space consisting of multiple layers. In the, at the very top, the data, in the data space, organizations can make endpoints and services discoverable. Once discovered, they can dynamically enter into data sharing agreements to share and reuse personal data across organizational boundaries. The data space is served by one or more my data operator or data intermediaries such as iGrant.io. The intermediation layer manages end user agreement consents to and ensures lawful use of personal data. It also provides digital world SDKs for cloud and mobile environments. At the very bottom, the data intermediary relies on one or more trust anchors to ensure integrity and authenticity during a personal data exchange transaction. Depending on the data source, these trust strangers could be X509 or PKI-based standards, or could be based on ledger solutions such as, for example, EBSI or European Blockchain Service Infrastructure, Sovereign, ID Union, and in certain cases, it could support both these protocol standards. The solution we trial has two ex visible external parts. On the left side, we have the Data for Diabetes Decentralized app that is interfacing towards the end users with a complete control and visibility of their data at any given point of time. The data resides entirely in the data in the decentralized app. On the right side is the data space portal, which brings several data sources into the health data space via the data intermediary. The data source and the data, data can be from any data space as long as they support decentralized protocol standards such as W3C verifiable credentials embedded as wallets in any app or in any IT system. Please do feel free to contact us for more information. Based out of Sweden, we are a bunch of nerds with business, technical, and legal backgrounds coming together to build a cross-border, scalable, and verifiable data space infrastructure. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks very much, Lel, um, again, for, for good, good timekeeping there. Um, there's um, a couple of questions you might have seen on the chat uh, um, just uh, just uh, curious uh, so, so let me just uh, just uh, mention them both firstly about the business model who pays whom how much and for what uh, and secondly then uh, then you know the data space uh, uh, in the Swedish context is it viable uh, and how does this relate to actually the European health data space that Citra is leading can you uh, uh, answer these very quickly yeah. So the first question about the business model, business model is uh, entirely based on transactions. Uh, for every verification, we, we charge a small fee. We also have a onboarding fee for every organization that want to be part of the ecosystem from a my data operator or a data intermediary perspective. Uh, when it comes to the decentralized app business model, it's entirely up to the app provider uh, to bring forth any a viable model uh, from an end user point of view and from uh, an overall system per se. The second question is when it comes to the uh, in, in interworking with them, other, other uh, initiatives, uh, it's still in a very much in the early phase. Uh, we haven't really been conversing yet with the, uh, with the Citra initiative. 
that is something which we hope we can do it. However, uh, we are a lot involved in the cross-border data exchange uh, with government entities in Finland, Sweden, and Norway uh, as we speak. So hopefully we are able to also align uh, in this initiative going forward. All right, thanks, Lal. And there's uh, interest in this uh, this topic for sure. Um, in the in the Q and A, there's people asking more. We don't have time to get into that, I'm afraid. Um, so, um, if you can kindly uh, stop your sharing and let uh, let Marku uh, continue, and please do continue engaging there. So, um, with that, I'd like to introduce the next presenter, uh, Marku Mehtala from uh, from Superhood. And Marco, I think this is your first time uh, um, at least presenting at, uh, at a My Data event. So perhaps you are, from our point of view, a, a new new company who has found us. So very happy you are here. Um, take it away. Yes, happy to hear. Uh, happy happy to he be here. And 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 thanks thanks for the uh, opportunity. Yes, hi. So I'm I'm Marco. I'm the founder and CEO of Superhood. So Superhood is a social platform for neighborhoods and cities. So during the pandemic, uh, a lot of people have started to kind of look at what's happening in in, in their neighborhoods, and and um, as it turns out, a lot of neighborhood data is kind of lost in silos and different channels. So it's really hard to keep up what is going actually going on in your neighborhood. So obviously, you're 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 kind of turning into your neighbors neighbors and peers to 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 get some information. However. The, the, the social platforms today are not really optimal for, for local information. So like there are uh, uh, these local social media groups, which are closed groups. You can either get in or you might not get in. There are random rules and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and excessive algorithms that are kind of preventing the access to, uh, to, 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 the, to the right information. And, and, and of course, you, you have to have an account and, and you have to kind of release your personal information and, and be under uh, 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 great user tracking to actually get information from your local neighborhood. So we uh, at Superhood, we kind of took the challenge to create a new platform dedicated to all things local. So Superhood is a social app and, and platform. We do aggregate news and information from various sources. Uh, we don't copy that information. We provide links. So we are like an index to, uh, to, to, to local, local, local information. We help people to discover and influence the issues in, in, in the local neighborhood and city. And we enable this social interaction between the neighbors, but also between the people and the services and, 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 and businesses. So Superhood is really built as a privacy-first, scalable, global local media platform. But local neighborhood is not only about the people who live there. Uh, local neighborhoods are whole ecosystems. So there are authorities and city organizations that are governing those, those, those areas. There are businesses that, that operate in, 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 in those areas and so on. So we at Superhood, we are building value for the whole ecosystem. So not only for people to keep up with what's going on in the in, in the neighborhood, we enable these organizations and businesses to really reach the relevant people and engage with 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 them. So how does it work? So um, you can download the Superhood app to your phone. You can swipe in. Superhood doesn't have any mandatory user account, so you don't have to create an account. So you can swipe in, or you can go to our website and and and, and browse the feed on 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 the browser. So you can find your neighborhood uh, in on a list, or you can even draw your own neighborhood on a map. So you you, you actually get your exact area, what is your interest, and of course you can add multiple different uh, places and neighborhoods there, and immediately you get an access to your local neighborhood feed, news feed. What is going on? What what the city is uh, uh, informing about, and so on. And you can control that feed uh, uh, with your interest. So you you don't have to read everything uh, uh, from 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 that location. So you can actually select what type of subject subjects are in, of interest to you. And when you're ready, of course, as a social platform, you can also share information to your 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 neighbors and and, and neighborhood. So for that. Eventually, you, you you can create an account, 
and and and, and share share news and things. So we do also have tools for businesses and organizations. So we have a small business app for for local uh, coffee shops and 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 and, and barber shops and, and whatnot. And we do have SaaS tools for the local authorities and and organizations and large businesses. So we really help the the, the businesses to uh, to to engage with with, with people. So Superhood is a social platform. We are kind of same, same, but if different in, a, in, in, in the means that we have similar user experience than the, uh, the, uh, the other platforms. However, in Superhood, there is no followers. There's no closed groups, no gatekeepers to keep, uh, uh, keep you away from uh, information. We have no user tracking. We have no reason to, uh, to collect user information. Our business model is not based on, on profiling users for, for advertisers. And we aim to have no anxiety in our platform. Our business model, our revenue comes. We do have uh, uh, location targeted advertising. We do have premium features. And we do have the SaaS tools for, for large organizations. So do check out Superhood and keep up with your neighborhood with Superhood. We are live in Finland and looking for partners to go abroad. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Marco. Um, you just touched on the uh, on the obvious question, which was uh, was all about that. Where is it available? And since it's in Finland, how does it relate to, for example, the the app that uh, that Infotripla has made with Forum Virium? Um, but uh, but you said you're looking for partners. So what uh, what kind of partners are you actually looking for then? So, like for example, in Finland, we are partnering with media companies who already have, have uh, local news and so on. So, so we, are, we are working with some major media companies in Finland to be announced. And, uh, and uh, so, so partners like that, um, major cities, uh, uh, media companies, and, uh, and, um, and, and so on. All right, super. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for that, uh, that Marco. And uh, on we go to the next one. So I have uh, here Vihtori. And I will just put you off the stage. Hello. Hello. Let me get Marco off the stage. And Vihtori is coming from uh, uh, presenting on GDPR problem or opportunity. So um, stage is yours. Yep. Thank you. Um, let's see if this works. <laughs> Can you see it? Hello. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. It's from the backstage. We can't shout out. Oh, OK. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> So hello, everybody. My name is Vihtori Lehtonen, and I'm uh, the CEO of a company called Missing Link. And today I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, privacy and data privacy from our company's point of view. So uh, first, let's dig into what is the missing link. Uh, so we as a company have developed a deep tech solution and we have a new data source. Victory, uh, Victory. Yeah. sorry, we lost uh, your presentation. You had it and uh, then we... We lost it. Okay. So what do you can see now? Let's let oh let's add again. And now is there? Okay, there we go. Now I'm out of here. Okay. Yeah. So sorry about that. So uh, like I was saying, we are a deep tech company and uh, we have a new data source. So basically, you know, it's very fun to have a new data source uh, for uh, what provides all sorts of useful data about networks and such, uh, about people and devices and, you know, the locations of the devices. But uh, we also um, then came across with uh, data management problems. So basically, uh, in our company, when we think about it, that how we would like our 
own private data to be used and how would uh, we generate the most uh, beneficial ways to our customers to use their own data f through uh, our platform from the devices what we are used to uh, use to collect uh, their data without knowing that it's theirs. Uh, so we have a ever increasing need for our data management systems and uh, Usually our customers, our paying customer is not uh, the one who, the individual whose data we are actually collecting. So there is uh, many problems what we needed to solve. So um, we have lots of advisors. Uh, I'm sure that you are not agreeing with them. So um, everybody is saying to us uh, that, okay, GDPR is hard and, you know, change the product. Even though that you know the product doesn't do anything wrong, uh, we uh, we have a technology what can do what can do. Uh, the problem is that you know how to manage the data in a right kind of way. The second advice we what we commonly get is that you know they are saying that you know narrow down the market and you find a corporation or a country where you don't have a GDPR laws, that that is your uh, silver bullet for the market. So our complications with uh, that approach is usually that it will postpone the, uh, the problem, what we know that, you know, GDPR brings to us uh, to the future, or uh, it will just not make a scalable use case. So our uh, data management hierarchy basically is uh, this. We are a system um, provider who uh, gives the operators or to our customer keys to the system to do whatever they want, uh, as long as it's, you know, uh, according to our terms and use. And then they can um, define that what purpose they are uh, using the data so that we can and uh, their customer and the individual can know and track that do they want to be involved or not and then you know there is a layer by layer uh more definition until the individual user who is always the one who is calling the search so at the end of the day um we are making this kind of uh, data wallet kind of approach to the problem so that every time when we have a data and if we find whose data it is, it becomes under the GDPR uh, their property. And therefore, um, I think that this management hierarchy in our case works. So as that wouldn't have been uh, problematic enough. Uh, we know uh, that the, at the near future, there is a, a software liability rules coming on place in Europe. So I think that, or we think that it's a good thing that is happening, that you can find responsibilities uh, from the software or AI or any of the uh, tech use cases and uh, I think that um, this becomes as a new market uh, opportunity for those companies who are uh, ready for the change. Uh, we have seen that the meta, so Facebook is going off to the EU most likely, and most of the other companies as well, because it seems to be a hard ball to handle. But I'm sure that if any of the companies who are listening or uh, are thinking of what to do next, um, we uh, are at the right track in this group and this conference. And I think that um, it's worth of your time to do things right. And um, our tips as a company for anybody who is at the same position or thinking what to do next is to um, be ready and, you know, find out what is coming. And the most valuable thing, what, what I have learned as a tool is the Citrus um, Fair Data Economy, what has been like uh, one of the building blocks for our company's 
policies for what regardless of data. So that is all from me. Uh, thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, please come to talk to me. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Victory, for that. And uh, actually great to hear. Uh, I believe you are also uh, perhaps the first time at my data events. Great to hear you are going by the uh, or looking at the Citra Fair Data Economy Rulebook uh, um, as uh, as that's uh, that's uh, you know we work a lot with Citra as well and they are a, the, a dear partner to us. Can I just ask how did you end up finding that? Uh, you were well, recruited to their program. <laughs> well, that was uh, uh, actually you know between the other project uh, from Fin Traffic. So basically, you know there is a. Um, similar kind of projects as for uh, uh, how to manage the data and how to make it so that uh, you can use it for um, um, making a business in a fair way. So they were copying that for uh, their rule book. So that's how I came across. <laughs> Excellent. Let's have that uh, put into the resources as well. Thanks a lot, uh, Victoria. And uh, on we go to the next one. Um, so the next one is uh, uh, Canary Bit, and we have Nikolai Paladi, CEO, presenting. So uh, go ahead, Nikolai. Hi, thanks. Thank you, Timo. So this is Canary Bit, uh, and I'm going to start by telling you a story. So a couple of years ago, uh, my wife uh, was doing research, uh, research in the Arctic. Uh, she's studying coastal erosion and permafrost thaw. So these are very expensive expeditions. Uh, it costs a lot to get there, to collect the data, to get all the permits. So she collected all the data. You see, it's not her, but someone else here with the LIDAR. Uh, she collected all the data to, to uh, map later on on, uh, on satellite images the characteristics of, of uh, permafrost thaw. But the, she only did that for a small segment. She published that. And then a researcher from a different faraway university contacted her and asked for the satellite images and labels and uh, all the meta information. Well, unfortunately, the institution didn't want to share that because that was very costly proprietary information. Uh, and they said like, well, what about uh, you send us the machine learning model that you want to, to run this on? Uh, well, on, the other researcher didn't really want to share the research, uh, the machine learning model, because that was also proprietary information. And then I thought, like, well, surely there must be a way to solve this. But then, no, actually, if you want to collaborate with data and run some some machine learning uh, code or some other algorithm on it, you either have to send over the data or send over the algorithm. And that's exactly the problem that we're solving. So our mission is to enable business to business collaboration with confidential data sharing. And what do I mean by this? So right now, today, there's a big problem that many organizations want to collaborate, share the di digital assets, that being data or algorithms, machine learning models, you name it. However, they're also reluctant. And why are they reluctant? Well, first of all, it's some sort of fear. It's some sort of fuzzy fear that something can go wrong. There are unclear regulations or even misunderstanding of regulations around this. And there are also business constraints and very often poor data governance in organizations. And honestly, today, after searching a lot, we realize that there are no solutions. There are only workarounds. So one very common workaround, uh, I think we all are familiar with it, is just blind trust. Just blind trust into some um, big logo, big vendor, and uh, go for it. Just give them your data and they will give you some service for it. Often free. Wow, amazing. Another option, um, very common in B2B, is legal negotiations. They are very expensive and lengthy. So lawyers enjoy that, but no one else. Another option is just no collaboration. So nothing happens. That was exactly the case uh, in, in the story that I presented above. So we solve this using some new technology. And we, and we start from the ground up. We start from hardware security, because no, no uh, application can be made secure if you don't start from the ground up. And so we use some novel technology called confidential computing, which encrypts data in use. And using that, we have a service where the two parties meet. On one hand, you have the data providers here on the right. On the other hand, you have the, um, let's say, algorithm providers or machine learning model providers 
who join their digital assets in this confidential uh, environment. So we don't see the data. Neither party sees the, the, uh, the, the assets or the data. It's all just put into this black box and the, uh, get out the result. The best of it is that they can get verifiable uh, let's say logs that they can later on verify, show to their auditors, show to the forensics uh, to know what exactly happened if something needs to be investigated. So the platform looks is a combination of three microservices. So first there's the studio, where the, which allows to share and process the sensitive data. There's the inspector that allows to verify the setups and get this cryptographically verifiable information about the, the environment where the uh, code and data were run. And then there was also the tower microservice that allows to manage the resources and build pipelines out of such environments. Let's say you want to perhaps pre-process the data, clean it up in a confidential environment, and then you want to actually join it with a third-party um, machine learning algorithm. This is a growing opportunity. And according to Gartner, by 2025, which is just around the corner, half of the large organizations will be using confidential computing for multi-party data analytics. Because there's a growing understanding among large corporations that they need to collaborate, they need to, to grow their market by, through collaboration, but they also want to hold on to their uh, digital assets. Our added value that we keep stressing on is, first of all, EU compliance. There are so many uh, solutions that you can uh, use from, from elsewhere that just rely on blind trust, but this is not the, the, the way we take. We are looking uh, a lot at your compliance, and so this is our core value. Another important um, added value point is we are agnostic, we're cloud agnostic, vendor agnostic, and data portability is very easy. And finally, this brings us to no lock-in. If you want, you can run on whatever cloud provider uh, you choose. Uh, we will support that. This is a product uh, made in Sweden for Europe. We have a large team uh, that has combined experience in cloud, cybersecurity, and technology transfer. We have a very active board, which helps us with all of these uh, issues that, needs to, that need to be navigated. Thank you for listening to me and get in touch for a demo. I'll be ready. To, I'll be ready and happy to assist you. Thanks a lot, Nikolai. And uh, always nice to uh, um, be able to get uh, get in touch for the demo and you have a concrete call to action there. Uh, just quickly and also trying to catch up on just a bit on the schedule. But maybe you saw the question from Mikhail. Um, what about if the problem was not sharing data or algorithm or the uncertainty of how much you should be compensated? Uh, so at least some of that problem would still persist. Uh, uh, okay, so rather the, the okay, so the problem is uncertainty about how much to be compensated. Well, um, I think the the difference is between like getting no access whatsoever and getting uh, some access to the data. And then the, the compensation, this is a matter of negotiation between the two parties. Uh, I have never yet seen a case where the two parties cannot agree. Well, in, <laughs> in that case, I, I guess uh, they simply cannot do business with each other. They cannot agree about the price. That, that's quite obvious. It's, it's like any market. If you don't like the price of, of, of this item, they'll just go to the next vendor. Thanks a lot, Nikolai, and uh, good luck. Thank you. All right. Um, so the sixth of the eight pitches, uh, I've got Colin Brown from Capability Brown and going to talk about age verification to preserve privacy. Uh, thanks for joining, Colin. I hope you were able to get all set up. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, good. I'll just wait for you to get your presentation going and then I will duck out. Okay, that's fine. Give me one second then. All right, all is good. Okay, hold on, let me just put it on um, view screen. Hopefully that's good for everybody. Okay, brilliant, thanks, Dima. Um, so look, today, guys, I'm gonna talk about um, data privacy at scale. 
and how you can effectively preserve privacy when you're talking about tens or hundreds of millions of users. And I'm going to give you a couple of real example case studies. Um, so, um, hold on. Okay. So just quick round on Yoti. Um, so Yoti is a British company that effectively has five products. Um, and effectively, the, the, the core product is a, an identity app that is quite well known, about 4 million users, individuals basically utilizing the app to share on their terms their identity with others. So reusable identity credentials. They also have four other products, which effectively are identity verification, age verification, facial authentication, and e-signatures. This is not a sales pitch, right? I'm going to talk about real use cases, uh, and we're going to start around age verification. So age verification um, is all focused on effectively the ability for someone to look into a camera for an algorithm to determine their age and to see if they can effectively access appropriate age-gated services. Um, now, Yoti is a very ethical company, so we publish on a quarterly basis a white paper, which basically outlines the accuracy of our own algorithm with regard to specific groupings. Yeah, so is it more accurate with people with an Arabic facial structure? Is it more Arabic with people from, a, from a different ethnicities? So again, what we're talking about here in terms of use cases um, is effectively where you've got a high friction environment, yeah, and you've got large numbers, okay? So these are Yoti's current customers in these spaces. So effectively, when we talk about online or e-commerce, we're talking about Instagram or Epic Games or Lego or Sony PlayStation. So imagine a situation, I have a 12-year-old boy, he wants to, wants to access specific games via uh, the Epic Games platform. Some of those games are age-gated. They need to make sure that effectively it is Colin, the parent, giving permission for Toby, the 12-year-old, to access the product, rather than Toby, the 12-year-old, who has access to Colin's email address or password. Yeah, so age gating, checking the, uh, the age of the individual who is consuming the product at the point of delivery. So Yoti basically provides these services for Instagram in terms of making sure that, the, that it's an over 18 accessing a service or it might be an over 13 accessing in some aspects. Now, another example that you're all very familiar with, I'm sure I am from a UK perspective, is in the self-checkout at a major retailer. This is where you walk up in the UK, you can purchase alcohol, or you can purchase over-the-counter drugs like paracetamol um, in, a, in a supermarket self-checkout, but it's not a good purchasing experience because you scan the item, scan all your other items, and then the till goes, wait for somebody to come over, and, and this is a busy customer person, service representative comes over, looks at you, doesn't check your identity, looks at you and then enters a PIN code. So effectively, what's happening in the UK and is happening in other jurisdictions now is age verification is becoming part of the self-checkout experience. And again, I think this is a really good example of high friction for the user, high friction for the retailer. It does not reduce the alcohol sales and it doesn't, it doesn't mean that inappropriate products get into inappropriate hands. In fact, it actually reinforces that because the system at the moment is not a strong system. We also have then basically um, age verification shown on your phone. So in the UK, uh, at the post office and in all UK cinemas, instead of taking your passport out or your driving license, and most teenagers don't have a driving license, to show that you can access a particular film, uh, that is age gated, you can effectively utilize the OTID to prove not your date of birth, that you, but you are over 18. And then also there is other opportunities in gambling kiosks where there's very clear legislation that effectively age gating is an important point. So what we're talking about here is preserving privacy 
and really focusing on um, the opportunity around improving customer experience. A couple of real examples. Um, some of you may be familiar with the um, social media network Ubo. Ubo has 60 million um, uh, teenagers who basically access their product. They wrote at uh, utilized GOT technology to age check the 60 million individuals. And what they found is thousands, sadly, of adult men wishing to access my age plus, access teenage chat rooms. Those accounts were suspended, right? Ubo is very, very clear that it wants young people, 13 to 17 year olds, to talk to other young people, 13 to 17, and again, make sure that effectively inappropriate individuals are not accessing those systems. So 60 million accounts were checked, thousands of accounts were suspended because they didn't meet the age profile. Uh, here's a good example of another social media app. Uh, with hey, social app, hey. again, oops, sorry. Need, need to wrap up in about a minute uh, for oh. time. No worries. That's uh, right. I'm at the end. Um, so look, um, let me stop sharing. Let me come back to the main screen so I can see you all. So all I'm telling you there is age verification can be done at scale to preserve privacy. Yeah. And ultimately, Yoti utilizes and publishes the accuracy of its algorithm. Um, so that we effectively show where we are in real time with regard to different age and ethnic groups. Thanks, Colin. There was an interesting comment from the commentary, and thanks, Mikhail, for being such an active participant, as always, uh, that uh, on Instagram, you've got companies um, also. So with the company uh, uh, um, verification uh um, it's uh, it's it's a bit bit tricky with the with the age thing. So perhaps a service design issue, not a simple one. Um, there's a couple of people who wanted to connect um, on the chat, so please have a look. Uh, but I'm afraid we've got to uh, got to go on for now. Um, so next, I will bring on to the stage uh, Roland Ewens and Leon. Okay, Leon is not here, so I have. Uh, have Roland Ewens from uh, Da Vinci Consulting. And we can see your slides, so I will just hide myself and on you go. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm a consultant for Da Vinci Consulting, which is a consultancy uh, organization primarily focused on uh, public-private partnerships. And currently we're working on a several projects regarding uh, SSI credentials in combination with civil law donatories, healthcare professionals, government and financial institutions. So life events such as healthcare uh, issues and settling a state after someone passed away are surrounded by uh, complex legal documents, uh, which is a relatively heavy burden for uh, the next of kin. So some numbers that has there are 160,000 uh, diseases of deaths in the Netherlands per year. Currently, with settling an estate, uh, there are around 20 organizations involved. And the Netherlands has uh, around 1 million living wills. And 600,000 people are partially incap incap uh, incapacitated or not able to fully uh, represent themselves, either in a hospital or in a financial situation. Uh, we're looking into utilizing the SSI framework to present people or to give people the ability to share only a small amount of their uh, legal documents to uh, the verifying. So for instance, in the situation of a living will, a notary, uh, drafts a living will and extracts credentials to the patient. The patient can then uh, show the hospital, okay, I would like this person is my contact person and this person uh, can decide whether or not I want treatment if I'm not capable of providing that information myself. So the hospital then using uh, the SSI framework can verify if it's still valid and uh, if it's a legitimate uh, credential. So the medical mandates, we want to utilize the normal wallets. We're also looking into combining uh, the European health insurance card, utilizing 
a potential NFC chip uh, as a wallet in order to be more friendly for people who do not have the digital abilities of utilizing a wallet. There are some uh, EPSI uh, projects regarding or based on those uh, digital wallets or those NFC wallets. We're looking into them right now. So if you want to join us, yeah, make the world a better place, providing conclusions from legal documents. Uh, we're interested in, in to hear your opinion. We're also looking into uh, a more international context. So from people are working cross borders or people have uh, heritages from different countries and maybe they have hairs there. So, and of course we're running pilots. And if you have a good idea and want to join us, please contact us. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Um, I had to do a little bit of background admin. I missed some of the presentation. Um, how can the community best help and get uh, get in touch with you? Uh, you can contact us through LinkedIn or through our company's website but, or email address as well. All right. And what is it most that um, I believe you are or have you been, been in touch with the MyData community? There is a uh, Quite a few people uh, working on, uh, on 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 SSI and, and 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 such. Are you are you linking with those people right now? Yeah, we're linking the, with those people, and we also have or uh, we run a few pilots with, uh, for instance, Schluss, which is a, a wallet slash uh, provider. We have run some uh, uh, pilots with them as well, and they are quite active in. All right, that's that's wonderful, and certainly there are a few people on the chat as well who are very uh, potential uh, collaborators uh, there. Super, thanks a lot uh, for that. Uh, and then finally, our last uh, last one from uh, from this pitch session: operator my data operator interoperability with consent receipts. Uh, so we got. Sensor Trend and Data Fund presenting their collaboration. So, off you go. Hello, thank you, Temo. So, let me just check that. Okay, I can. I think you can see the, the screen, right? Uh, hello, everyone. Yes. So, I'm Chert from Data Fund, and together with Mikael from Sensor Trend, uh, we will present to you what we are doing as part of the My Data Operators. Um, Interoperability, de interoperability demonstrations uh, initiative. So in a nutshell, um, we are um, saving a consent receipt generated by, by a health app, by Sensor Trend, to personal data storage, uh, which is FairDrive. So um, let's maybe start with a bit of the basics to get the context. Um, with GDPR and other regulation, um, you, you probably follow that consent is needed for certain pu purposes of data usage. And consent can be documented in the form of a consent receipt, uh, like a document, a digital document that has all the important information about the consent that you have given. Cantara specification offers a common uh, format to record this receipt. So, um, and uh, this is good because it leads to interoperability. And we can have uh, different services access the data in the consent receipts and act upon it. FairDrive is also a MyData op op operator and uh, it is a special kind of personal data storage because it offers decentralized storage, um, um, self-sovereign in a way that uh, you know no central point of control uh, exists over it. And imagine that imagine it be used as a sort of shoebox for storing this receipt. So you have a folder in FairDrive reserved for all the different consent receipts you get from many apps and, and various sources. You just put it in there. And what you do then is allow access to different services to this folder. And they can do like uh, magical things on, on top of this shoebox. Um, like, um, uh, managing them, um, getting an overview of what is happening with them, but even you know more advanced uh, services can be um, done, like exercising your GDPR rights say, on anal analyzing uh, under what kind of risks you are based on who you share your data with, and, and so on. 
So um, at this point, I would uh, give the microphone to Mikhail. Uh, and Mikhail, you just tell me when you want to switch the slide, please. Yeah, thanks, sir. So we are Sensor Trend. We do diabetes remote monitoring. We combine data from many medical devices and wellness tractors, and we derive actionable insights out of that. And we also help people share their data for both healthcare and for medical research, for instance. Next slide, please. So we have this concept of permissions and fine-grained access controls. And we really like the idea of consent receipts. So each time you give a permission to somebody to access your data, you get an actionable receipt out of that. So you can better keep track of who has access to your data. And for these consent receipts to be really useful, I think we need some kind of consent wallets where you then store all your receipts and can keep them organized. And here we built integration to data fund so that the receipt can be stored in the fair drive. And we'd like to expand this, this model to other operators as well. So some are mentioned there, but this is really the first one that's actually operational. Next slide, please. So really an invitation to all my, my data operators. Let's work on this. Let's make it happen together. One thing that we have identified is that it would really help if there would be a registered mime time type for consent receipts so that we as a service would just publish a file and then regardless of which app the person is using, that app would pick up the consent receipt notice. Hey, now my user is downloading a consent receipt file. I'll help it through here. And then of course, consent receipts could be made more actionable. Like you could use the consent management app to change the status of the permission or inspect the log files, who has access to your data and which data and when, based on which permission. And next slide, please. That's it from us. So really happy to see more in involvement in this project. And thank you, my data. And thanks yeah. for the yeah. audience for your attention. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. So, and if you want to uh, get in touch with us, you can use the My Data sl Slack. So, thanks a lot, uh, Mikhail and and Zert, um, as uh, for this. Um, and it's great that you are kind of. Uh, I know that you both are enthusiasts in doing the interoperability work and then uh, then doing it in 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 practice. Uh, I do wonder, of course, if there are other operators here and. Uh, what we can do to encourage. Do you have a thought as to how we can encourage others to work on this interoperability? I mean, it's a word that everybody uh, says we need it, but then it's uh, difficult to, to do in practice. What's the magic sauce? FOMO, fear of missing out. Yes. When some, some okay, so, operators so, so, start so doing this, we'll then... Be interoperable. Yeah. So you're, we are already interoperable, so you know, you're, we'll be there and you won't be, so... Okay, and just in terms of being uh, uh, practical and concrete, there's the my data operators uh, uh, link that I that I shared. But do you have a next uh, operators meeting or any other event uh, coming up in the foreseeable future on this? It was 16th or 19th of November, but yes. Okay, we are so it's coming up quite soon in two or three three weeks. So that's the that's the uh, uh, the next concrete action. Super, thank you. Thank you to both of you. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to thank uh, all um, those who took the time to pitch. Uh, please uh, stay tuned. Uh, please uh, interact with others. There's still uh, plenty of us uh, in the session. Uh, and as we're coming to the top of the hour, that marks the end of the first block of program. So we're going to continue in two hours uh, with the programmatic parts. However, right now there are several uh, networking sessions. Uh, so I would highly encourage you to have a look. Um, also, perhaps network and engage with others, explore this uh, new tool. Uh, and then we see at the plenary in, uh, in two hours. 
So thank you very much for joining. Thank you, everybody who uh, pitched. And uh, if you have an opportunity, please uh, donate to the event organizer. Thank you.